the title of my talk, Moving In, Moving On, refers to the fact that Lee Krasner, in many uh, aspects of her career, was actually in either the same studio, uh, but not at the same time, or following on from Jackson Pollock after she and he moved in together in 1942. So that's, uh, that's the reference that I'm making in the title. And here she is in the upstairs bedroom studio that was formerly Pollock's. On August 15th, 1956, the painter Lee Krasner watched stoically as her husband Jackson Pollock was buried in Green River Cemetery in Springs, a hamlet in the town of East Hampton on Eastern Long Island. Several of those who attended the funeral later remarked on how calm and controlled she was, but her outward composure masked in the emotional turmoil that she allowed only a few close friends to see. Pollock's death in a drunken car crash four days earlier was the tragic culmination of their turbulent relationship, which had been strained to the breaking point by his affair with Ruth Kligman, a 26-year-old art student. With her friend, Edith Metzger, 25 years old, who had come out to visit for the weekend, Kligman was a passenger in Pollock's Oldsmobile convertible when it careened off the road, plowed into a stand of trees and overturned. Kligman was injured, but Pollock and Metzger were killed. When the accident happened, Krasner was in Paris on a trip that allowed her to distance herself from the situation at home where Pollock's alcoholism was out of control and his infidelity was humiliating to her. Without her steadying influence, however, his downward spiral accelerated until it reached what his biographers, Stephen Nafee and Gregory White Smith described as escape velocity. Um, on his death, she became his sole heir to the work that remained in his studio, a converted storage barn on their property. Pollock had used the building since 1946 when Krasner worked in a small upstairs room which had previously been his studio. She now had the responsibility of marketing his artistic legacy and of perpetuating his reputation as one of the foremost 20th century abstract painters. Judging by his stature today, more than 60 years after his death, and by the current prices for his work, she succeeded brilliantly on both counts. But Lee Krasner was much more than the formidable widow Pollock. And I, I love this Maplethorpe photograph of her because she really does look formidable. But this is the widow Pollock of legend. She was also a formidably talented artist who had willingly subjugated her professional ambitions to promote her husband's career. Now that he was gone, she had her own career to think about. When she and Pollock began their relationship in late 1941, Krasner was far better known in the minuscule art world microcosm that was the New York City avant-garde. She lived and worked in an apartment uh, at 51 East 9th Street, and that is what you see here. That's around the corner from Pollock's flat at 46 East 8th, and he was up here on the top floor. These photographs were taken by a uh, documentary project that was run under the WPA that was documented every building in New York City. Fantastic archive. Anyway, after she moved in with him uh, up into this apartment, uh, she, in 1942, she maintained a separate studio for a time, but later began to use the apartment's back bedroom as a workspace. There's only one known photograph of her in that space, and it faced south, which is not the ideal orientation for a studio. Pollock, by contrast, had the much larger front parlor, ideally lighted by north-facing windows, where he'd been working since he started sharing the apartment with his brother Sanford 10 years earlier. So right from the early days of their relationship, Krasner deferred to Pollock's practical needs often to the detriment of her own. Now, this was not simply a matter of male dominance and female subjugation. By her own account, following her exposure to Pollock's work, Krasner not only recognized his potential, but also underwent a profound reevaluation of her own artistic direction. 
As a student of the German emigre teacher and painter Hans Hoffmann, she had been traveling the well-worn path of European modernism for some five years and was among the leading New York neo-cubists. And you can see some examples of that work here. This is the, ninth, uh, this is the uh, 51 East 9th Street studio. As such, however, she and her colleagues in the American Abstract Artists Group were considered by the Cognoscenti to be enthralled to the School of Paris, followers at best and imitators at worst, certainly not the innovators they aspired to be. When she first saw Pollock's work, Krasner later said she felt she, that he was ahead of her. In a 1957 typescript, now among the Lee Krasner papers at the Archives of American Art, she described her response to her initial visit to his studio in December 1941. Quote, what did I think? I was overwhelmed, bowled over, that's all. I saw all those marvelous paintings. I felt as if the floor was sinking when I saw those paintings, unquote. Now, this is a painting called Birth, which is the painting Pollock put into the exhibition in which he and Lee were included of French and American paintings organized by John Graham at the Macmillan Gallery in 1942. And that was the occasion that caused them to meet. She, wanted to, she, she looked at the list of artists and there was a name on it that she didn't recognize. So she decided she would have to check his work out and make sure that he was worthy of exhibiting with her. Uh, together with Picasso, Matisse, and Brock, and a few other names she recognized. So she went to his studio and saw this painting, among others, and this is what bowled her over. In a 1981 interview with Grace Gluck of the New York Times, she discussed her responses in relation to her own development, specifically her acceptance of Hoffman's neo-cubist dicta. Quote, I was much more struck by what Jackson was about, she told Gluck. It opened a new channel, a new avenue for me. I started to break away from what I had learned and was involved with. She began, as she put it, to lose cubism and absorb Pollock. But she insisted she, quote, never became a Pollock, although technically she did because she married the guy. She said, I didn't because I wasn't a student of his in that sense. I admired him but also Mondrian and Matisse. One admires other artists, and I think I'd have admired him whether or not I was his wife. He would have affected me, end quote. But of course she was his wife, at first in all but name, and then legally as of October 25th, 1945, two days shy of her 37th birthday. In the early days of their union, she was constantly confronted with and challenged by his powerfully expressive imagery, which seemed to arise spontaneously from some deep creative wellspring. She tried to tap a similar reservoir within herself, but kept missing the mark. By her own account, she would work on a painting for months at a time, adding layer upon layer until the surface resembled mud. Then, so it wouldn't be a total loss, the frugal Krasner would soak those failed canvases in the bathtub, scrape them down, and give them to Pollock to paint on. But she continued to struggle through what she dubbed her gray slab period. Quote, I was putting masses of paint on canvas and nothing would happen, she later recalled. Just tons of paint going nowhere. It was all very frustrating, unquote. Ironically, her only surviving campus, canvas from that time bears the name of her former lover, Igor Pantuhoff, a painter with whom she lived in the 1930s and who reportedly encouraged her artistic ambitions. Pantuhoff, a handsome white Russian emigre whom she met when they were fellow students at the National Academy of Design, was a dashing character, as you can see here, who went on to specialize in portraiture. According to their friend, the artist Fritz Bultmann, he paid great attention to Krasner as an artist. In Nathan Smith's Pollock biography, which I highly recommend, by the way, another doorstop like 9th Street Women, I'm afraid, 
The authors claim that Krasner was vir virtually stopped painting while she lived with Pantohoff from 1932 through 1939, yet some 100 of her works from that period, one sixth of her entire known oeuvre, have survived. After leaving the academy, she continued to take classes at Greenwich House and was employed on the New Deal art projects from 1934 on, primarily on the WPA Federal Art Project's mural division. And although it's not certain, we think that this is Lee right here at work on someone else's mural. And that was a great frustration for her because she wanted to do a mural of her own, but she kept uh, doing mopping up operations or, or uh, assistant work for other muralists. And it was Pantuhoff who in a brief flirtation with modernism first enrolled in Hoffman's school, and he probably suggested to Krasner that she also attend, which she did from 1937 to 1940. In June 1944, Krasner temporarily moved her studio from Pollock's back room to a spare room in the apartment of a friend and fellow artist, Reuben Kadish, who believed that she and Pollock were getting on each other's nerves. They were, oh, here's a quote. They were so competitive that they couldn't even work in the same house together, Kadish told Pollock's biographers, Nafee and Smith. Whether or not having adjoining studios troubled Pollock, it evidently bothered Krasner. According to Kadish, quote, she was being digested into oblivion by his presence, unquote. Again, only one canvas from that period has survived and it shows her returning to the cubist structure she had learned from Hoffman, albeit overlaid with expressionistic brushwork. You can see that this actually resembles some of those more hard edged cubist still lives that she was doing in the thirties. However much conflict Krasner was experiencing creatively, she continued to promote Pollock's nascent career. By this time, he had been taken up by Peggy Guggenheim a niece of Solomon R. Guggenheim, whom the war had forced to return to her native New York City after many years as an expatriate in Europe, where she collected surrealist and abstract art and fraternized with the avant-garde. And I also, there are several biographies of, of Peggy uh, and, and including her own memoir, uh, which is called Out of This Century. Her family said it should have been called Out of Her Head, because she had many affairs and she definitely kissed and told big time in this book. I, a, a great read, so you should definitely look it up. In 1942, she opened a gallery on 57th Street called Art of This Century, where she showcased her collection and exhibited artwork by young unknown Americans. Now here she is, unfortunately you can only see her from the back, um, and this is, is sitting in this chair. This is Frederick Kiesler, the architect who designed this rather eccentric interior. <clears throat> Encouraged by trusted advisors like Marcel Duchamp, Pete Mondrian, and James Johnson Sweeney of the Museum of Modern Art, Guggenheim took Pollock on as her protege. She paid him a monthly stipend, commissioned a mural from him, and gave him his first solo exhibition in the winter of 1943. And if any of you are going to be in New York City anytime between now and September, you can see this mural on display at the Guggenheim in New York. It normally lives at the University of Iowa, but it's been on a world tour for quite a few years now while they rebuild the museum in Iowa where it will eventually return. Now Guggenheim was well aware that Krasner was also an artist having seen some of her paintings when she mistakenly entered Krasner's studio on her visit to see Pollock's work for the first time. In 1945, Guggenheim invited her to participate in a group exhibition, The Women, but though Krasner's name is listed on the announcement, she did not submit a piece for the show, perhaps because of her reluctance to be pigeonholed in an all-female context. She did participate in other group shows in the 1940s, including abstract and surrealist art in America at the Mortimer Brandt Gallery in Manhattan. Organized by Sidney Janis, who wrote the book of the same title in which Krasner's painting Composition was illustrated, the show went on a national tour in 1944. 
The following year, she was included in A Problem for Critics at Gallery 67 in Manhattan, where she was the only female artist among a roster of notable European and American modernists, including Pollock, Rothko, Picasso, and Miro. Whatever competitive pressure Krasner may have felt in the privacy of their adjacent studios, in public, she was Pollock's ardent champion. Clement Greenberg recalled that when she introduced him to Pollock, a virtual unknown when the two men met in late 1942 or early 1943, Lee declared with her, in her beautiful Brooklyn accent, this guy is a great painter. The writer Lionel Abel, a friend from those years, summed up the opinion of many observers, quote, she, that is Krasner, carried the ball for the enterprise. She thought the whole thing out from the beginning, how to put him over and how to make him a big success, end quote. It was Krasner's idea to move to the country in 1945, when Pollock's drinking and erratic behavior were threatening to derail the career she had cultivated with such determination for nearly four years. At first he resisted, but soon saw the wisdom of distancing himself from the city's plentiful temptations and distractions. They moved to a homestead in Springs in early November, renting at first while Krasner negotiated a loan from Guggenheim that would enable them to buy the property and settle down. By then they were married, and for the only time in their 15-year relationship, Pollock's studio arrangements were less comfortable than Krasner's. Since she apparently was never asked about it, nor did she volunteer the information, we can only speculate that her newfound domestic uh, security prompted her to assert herself. She appropriated the back parlor, the biggest room in the house. Now this is what it looked like uh, some 20 years later, but you can see it's got a beautiful bay window, although once again, it faces south rather than north, but it does provide abundant natural light. The room was also warmed by a Franklin stove. And if you look up here, you'll see there's a hole in the chimney that's been plugged up. That's where the stove pipe came down and the stove sat right over here. Now, together with the kitchen range, that was the building's only source of heat. Pollock set up shop in a chilly upstairs room, the smallest of the three on that floor, although it had the advantage of a north window. It also had privacy, which Krasner's workspace didn't, but compared to hers, it was cramped and spartan. Perhaps to compensate for the lack of heat, both painters experienced a burst of creative energy. Krasner emerged from her gray slab period with lively abstractions rendered in exuberant strokes of color, while Pollock began his Akabonic Creek series, infusing his cryptic imagery with a new brightness and openness. By the spring, when Guggenheim's loan enabled them to get a mortgage, they took title to the property and Pollock began clearing out the barn that would become his studio. It was ready by the fall, when he was already at work on his Sounds in the Grass series of all over abstractions. He showed 16 works from both series at Art of This Century the following January. Krasner completed only six paintings during this period, but she was a slow worker who constantly revised. And she was juggling her studio time with domestic chores, which were arduous in a house with no indoor plumbing or central heating. Years later, when asked what it was like at first, Krasner replied, how can I describe it? It was hell, to put it mildly, for me. In a more positive mood, however, she described their early days of country living as all a beautiful new experience. Notwithstanding the hardships, she had found a new and fruitful direction in her work that would carry her through the rest of the decade. Once the barn was cleared out and converted to serve as Pollock's studio, Krasner moved into his former studio upstairs in the house where she worked for about 10 years. In that small room, and I'll show you a picture of it in a moment, roughly 10 by 14 feet, she developed and refined her little image series of grid-based paintings, executed in a heavily layered impasto 
and sometimes embellished with calligraphic pourings, as you see here, of liquid paint. Now, she did not work on the floor. She would lay this on a tabletop in order to get the, uh, the poured effect. Meanwhile, Pollock was rapidly progressing with the all over poured paintings that made him famous. Both artists were moving into uncharted territory and often sought mutual reassurance. Although Cra according to Krasner, they only visited each other's studios by invitation. Occasionally during this period, however, much as they valued their privacy, necessity caused their working and living spaces to overlap. In a 1976 interview with the art historian Barbara Rose, Krasner mentioned that when it was too cold to paint in the upstairs unheated studio, she would come down and work in the back parlor. And so this, this uh, photograph shows a staircase that no longer exists in the house uh, in what is now the dining area. The barn studio was also unheated and although, according to Krasner, Pollock would manage in winter if he wanted to, he would get dressed up in an outfit the like of which you've never seen. He worked in the house when the barn got too cold. At least one of his paintings, large canvases rather, and probably many other smaller ones, as well as works on paper, were done near the warmth of the parlor stove. So this is the only major painting of his that we know was painted in roughly that same space as where you saw Krasner standing. If this overlap caused any professional tension between Pollock and Krasner, it is not recorded. The awkwardness of the situation may have been eased by Pollock's brief period of sobriety from late 1948 through 1950, during which time he was taking tranquilizers. Again, it's speculation, but possibly his <laughs> equilibrium made him easier for Krasner to tolerate underfoot. What we do know is that after central heating was installed, and if you look right over here, you will see the steam radiator in the upstairs studio. And that happened in late 1949. After that, Lee worked exclusively in the upstairs studio which Pollock entered by invitation only. And she equally respected his privacy. Her statements often refer to the arrangement whereby each would ask the other for an assessment of work in progress. And this is actually the only photograph that we have that shows him actually looking at one of her works. We have another picture that shows him holding one for the photographer Hans Namas to take a picture of but this is the only one where the two of them are actually contemplating one of her works uh, together. Anyway, she would describe this procedure and she did in an interview with Emily Wasserman in 1968, quote, generally I would preface it with a big bellyache about something and then I'd list what was bothering me. And when he'd come into the studio, he'd say something like, oh, forget all that and just keep painting. It's a lot of rot. For his part, Pollock greatly valued his wife's opinion. As she told Wasserman, he did keep saying, come and look, what do you think? I mean, that was a constant. So I take it that some part of my response was essential, you know, unquote. Whatever other elements their relationship may have been, their respect for each other's artistic integrity was surely an important, not to say a crucial component. This mutual sustenance, however, was nurtured and expressed in private. To the world at large, Krasner did not have a career in the professional sense of that term. Representation by a dealer who cultivated clients for the work and who mounted annual solo shows that were re reviewed in the press. But she did exhibit her work regularly, both in New York City and locally on Eastern Long Island. Two of her paintings and a mosaic table that she had made were featured in The Modern House Comes Alive at the Bertha Schaefer Gallery in 1948, when she and Pollock were both included in the annual invitational exhibition at Guildhall in East Hampton. Her painting won second prize, while Pollock's came in third. 
Her prize-winning painting may have been this untitled oil on pressed wood, which is inscribed on the stretcher, Lee Krasner, East Hampton, $350. Do I hear 400? Do I hear 450? Sold at 350. The Modern House exhibition reviews were the only ones in which her work was mentioned. Several publications reviewed it favorably. Writing in the New York Herald Tribune, Anne Pringle described the mosaic table as magnificent. In 1949, she and Pollock showed together in Man and Wife, a group exhibition at Sydney Janice Gallery in Manhattan, and again at Guildhall in 1950. The following year, they were both included in the so-called Ninth Street Show, a group exhibition that helped uh, establish the roster of the New York School and from which Mary Gabriel took her title. Because in fact, of the five uh, female artists who were the stars of, of that book, only one of them ever actually lived on Ninth Street, and that was Lee. It's really all about the exhibition. Also in 1951, after Pollock interceded on her behalf, she had her first solo exhibition at the Betty Parsons Gallery in Manhattan, where she uh, had been, where Pollock had been represented uh, since Peggy Guggenheim closed her gallery and moved to Venice in 1947. And in fact, Betty was quite reluctant to do the show. In fact, she said no at first because she did not want to represent a, a husband and wife, but Pollock insisted because he said he felt Lee was ready. And remember, this is 1951, her first solo exhibition in her career. Indeed, ever since Guggenheim gave him his first solo exhibition in 1943, Pollock had had an annual show in New York City every year. Guggenheim had exposed his work in Venice and it was being included in important shows across the United States and Europe. A profile in Life Magazine's August 8, 1949 issue broadcast his name to more than 5 million readers. By comparison, Krasner was virtually unknown. Although, as her exhibition history indicates, she was hardly invisible. But she had yet to achieve much recognition. Although a few critics wrote favorably about this 1951 Betty Parsons show, there were no sales. It was four years before she had another show, solo show in New York City. By the early 1950s, Paul, uh, Krasner evidently decided that she had outgrown the bedroom studio. Notwithstanding professional setbacks, she also, uh, she, and whatever reticence she felt about competing with Pollock, she also wanted a detached workspace. Now, it's interesting because I told you that that bar, that the upstairs uh, bedroom studio was only 10 by 14 feet. And yet look at the size of this painting. It's over 10 feet wide. So it must have filled the entire room. And you can imagine if she had ambitions to paint paintings of this scale or this size, she really must have felt that, that she was ready to, for, for something more ambitious. So in 1953, they bought an acre of land adjacent to their property and moved a small 19th century barn onto it with the intention of turning it into Krasner's studio. Although this never became her primary workspace, especially as it had a dirt floor, no heat and no electricity, her decision to establish a separate studio shows that she remained dedicated to her work in spite of her lack of professional validation as indicated by sales. Uh, Edward F. Dragon, Ted, and his companion, Alfonso Osorio, a personal friend who was also an artist and collector, acquired two of her works, but whether they were purchases or gifts is not clear. They were included in a selection from 12 East Hampton collections at Guild Hall in 1953. The following summer, Krasner had a one-day solo show at House of Books and Music in East Hampton. Again, nothing was sold. And here you see some examples. This is a collage painting. This is one of the little image paintings. And this is one of the personage paintings that you saw on her easel from 1950, which she later, she completely reworked that series. There are no surviving paintings from that group. From 1945 to 1955, 
When she exhibited her collage paintings at the Stable Gallery in Manhattan, Krasner's work underwent five distinct changes in direction, or breaks, as she called them. First, she abandoned the gestural exuberance of her initial, inspired by her initial encounter with Pollock's work for the thick paint and grid-like structure of the Little Image series. And this is one of the most beautiful ones. It's in a California collection. <laughs> then she made a series of geometric abstractions. This is the one that you saw her looking at with Pollock. And that quickly gave way to a few transitional expressionistic figure-based canvases. Those are the personage paintings, all of which were later reworked, that led to the abstract, oh, there's, a, there's the personage paintings on her easel. And that gave way to these series of color field paintings that she showed at Betty Parsons Gallery. And most of those canvases later served as the basis for a series of abstract collage paintings. So in other words, a painting like this would now be under this collage or painting from that group. And she began that series in 1953. So these abrupt directional shifts bespeak an aesthetic restlessness, dissatisfaction, or perhaps a lack of confidence that plagued her throughout her relationship with Pollock. By the end of that relationship, Krasner had made yet another transition, abandoning the collage technique for a return to straight painting and the exuberant brushwork and florid forms of her earlier expressionist phase. But the subject matter was figurative and much more ominous perhaps in response to her deteriorating marriage. Moreover, in spite of having produced and exhibited a solid body of work in the collage paintings, she had yet to receive much critical recognition, much less make a sale. Working in such emotional and professional turmoil, is it any wonder that the images in her 1956 paintings seem almost to be devouring themselves? And this is a particularly um, well, you can see the title is Prophecy, and what it prophesies is in fact Pollock's death, because you can see here, it's a bloated figure. He had gained a great deal of weight from his drinking. It has a head wound, which is actually what killed him, and it has an evil eye up here in the corner. And Lee said that when she came back to see this painting after returning from Europe following his death, and she confronted it on the easel, that it frightened her. Following his death, Krasner faced her greatest challenge, managing his estate and her own career simultaneously. After spending the, spending the winter in New York City, she returned to Long Island in the spring and began to make the transition from the upstairs studio to um, the barn. To my knowledge, she never spoke directly on the record about that transition, except to say that it was a hard time for her. One can only imagine the emotional toll it took to empty the space of his work, which bore the indelible stamp of his personality, to tack a blank canvas on the wall against which his canvases had formerly been stacked, and to wait for something to, as she put it, suggest itself. What did suggest itself is utterly remarkable. Remember that this was a woman in deep mourning Friends describe her as being devastated by Pollock's death, beset by guilt, anger, and sorrow. Wouldn't those feelings so evident to those who knew her be expected to manifest themselves in her work? What did emerge out of the emotional wellspring she had been trying to tap since her first encounter with Pollock's work was an explosion of voluptuous organic imagery rendered in lively brushwork and bright color exactly the opposite of what might have been anticipated. Years later, when the poet Richard Howard questioned her about this seeming contradiction, she was at a loss to explain it. I remember, she said, that when I was painting Listen, which is the picture you see here, it, which is so highly keyed in color, I've seen it many times since, and it looks like such a happy painting. I can remember that while I was painting it, I almost didn't see it because tears were literally pouring down." Unquote. If this was not a joyous time for Krasner, it was a period of great achievement, 
when she came when what came to be known as her Earth Green series asserted itself. And um, this is uh, the masterpiece of that series from in the Whitney Museum called The Seasons. And it asserted her artistic independence. Her response to speculation about her motivations was often an evasive, non-committal, I wouldn't know, or I couldn't say. In this case, however, it seems apparent that she was genuinely perplexed by the upbeat turn her work had taken in the face of her grief. Pollock's first biographer, B.H. Friedman, a close friend during that time, considers it to have been a kind of antidote to her negative feelings, as well as an assertion of her determination to move forward with her life and career. Whatever the cause, the effect was to liberate the creative energy that had been suppressed while she concentrated on managing Pollock. Moreover, instead of a tiny room, she now had a spacious studio with a high ceiling and 21 foot walls, and she made the most of it, enlarging both her format and her gesture. Krasner lived for 28 years after Pollock's death, dividing her time between New York City and Springs, where she used his former barn studio until severe arthritis and other health problems ended her productivity. Morning Glory, the last painting she is known to have done there, was completed in the summer of 19, uh, 1982. That December, she was photographed in her Manhattan studio, the converted bedroom of her, of her East 79th Street apartment, in front of what is believed to be her final work, a collage painting that illustrates her lifelong penchant for revisiting and recycling earlier material. It's made of drawings done in the Hoffman School that's what you see here. Some of these are charcoal drawings that she did in 19, between 1937 and 1940, collaged onto one of the few surviving 1951 color field abstractions that she hadn't already reworked, with new areas of paint added to unify the composition. This poignant final statement shows that for Lee Krasner, moving on often involved a paradoxical dialogue with the past. Thank you very much for listening, and I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Helen. So interesting. Uh, I've been entering a few comments in the chat just based on uh, your presentation, like for inst instance, um, uh, citing the Peggy Guggenheim book, the Out of This Century book, mm -hmm. uh, and also just for anyone who is in New York City, uh, to visit the Guggenheim and to view the Pollock mural. Um, but I I've also kicked us off with a question. I'm so curious about this. If you know the answer to who else appeared in the man and wife exhibition that you mentioned. Uh, let's see. I think Jim and Charlotte Brooks were in it. Um, I think possibly Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I, it's, it's an, it would have been interesting to know. Um, I'm, I'm certain that there is a record of it, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, because the um, gallery papers, I think, are in the archives of American art. Okay. Oh, I, I would love to look into that. And it's great that you mentioned Frida and Diego because one of my other notes uh, was about Frida and Diego that so much of what you were talking about seemed so similar to... Well, they had an even more tumultuous marriage because he was a serial womanizer, which at least Pollock wasn't that. Um, he wasn't an alcoholic, but uh, they did marry twice. So <laughs> she right. just couldn't give him up or he couldn't give her up or maybe that was mutual. Right. I think it was, I think it was both. And, and we focused on Frida uh, not that long ago, I guess maybe within the past year or so. Uh, and really focused on her rather than Diego. So it was very interesting to hear about the separate studio spaces, but still combined. Uh, th there was a dotted line. There was a mm -hmm. link there, but they- well, I, I believe in Mexico City, they had his and her studios that were adjacent and there was a bridge between them. That's right. So they could uh, either lock the door or, or not. <laughs> right, right. And I think that she probably enjoyed locking the door sometimes on. Huh? I think that's probably very often. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's see. We have a question from Carla. 
Um, did she sell many works of her own after her husband's death? Yes, she. It's funny because people think that she like just didn't have a career, but uh, shortly after his death, she was represented by Howard Wise, which was an A-list gallery in New York at the time. She had a couple of shows with him, and from there she went to Marlboro Gallery. And Marlboro had just opened their New York branch, and they were very eager to have the Pollock estate. They had already been working on it for some time from London, and. Uh, she took the estate to Marlboro and she went with it. So she was represented by Marlboro for several years and then she went to Pace Gallery, not exactly, you know, down market. And from Pace, she went to Robert Miller. So she had continuous representation throughout the, the period from Pollock's, a couple, a year or so after Pollock's death, right up until her own death. And her estate is now represented by the Kasman Gallery, which has currently an exhibition of her collage paintings from the 50s. And I, I wish I could get into the city to see it. It's on, just opened last week, and I think it closes mid-April. So any of you who are in the city or can get there, uh, this is an absolute pinnacle of her 50s, uh, the 50s period. So I highly recommend it. Are many of those collage pieces, as you described or and showed, um, as you showed us, where she took an older piece and then layered on with new material? Well, she began doing it in '53, and she she described the whole genesis of it quite effectively. She said she was doing a bunch of drawings, uh, ink drawings on paper, and she was dissatisfied with them, so she tore them up and threw them on the floor, and she pranced out of the studio, slammed the door, and didn't go back in for a couple of days because she was just pissed off that it wasn't working. And then she looked at them on the floor and she thought, hmm, maybe I could do something interesting with these. And she started collaging them onto the failed canvases, small and large, not only the big ones that she showed at Parsons, but other ones as well. And she also used some of Pollock's discarded drawings which she cut up or tore up and used those for collage elements as well. So, in, and some of his canvases, there's actually some canvas in them too. So if you see them, you can pick out little, little bits and pieces of Pollock in them. So oh, interesting. It sounds like uh, many of the ceramic, no, the mosaic artists I know who were ceramic artists, one in particular got into a car accident with her ceramic work and then uh -huh. became a mosaic artist because everything was broken and uh -huh. she had all of this material. So sometimes it comes out of that, you know, uh -huh. these literal happy accidents. Um, uh -huh. So I would love to see that work. That sounds amazing. Uh, let's see. I see a question. I see several questions. I see a lot of questions. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And, and great. So if you can, I'll just read them to those who can't access the chat. Um, why was Lee prone to domestic abusive, um, domestically abusive relationships with Igor and with Jackson? Well, I, I guess I get, it depends on how you define domestic abuse. I mean, they weren't physically uh, fighting, you know, they wasn't, wasn't fisticuffs, but they did abuse her in the sense that they took advantage of her. And Igor uh, was very unfaithful frequently, and in fact bragged about sleeping with the women whose portraits he painted. And finally, Lee just got fed up and, and then he, he up and left and went to Florida. In fact, if you Google him, he became, he was another drunk, unfortunately. That was what she was attracted to apparently, but he became a painter of big eyed girls. And there is a whole, like an Igor fan club and people who collect this stuff. And if you Google him, you'll see it. But he was, he failed because he, he drank himself to death and he actually died in 1972. Mm. But she actually remained friendly with him for the rest of her life. She, she never discarded people that she'd been intimate with. It's very interesting. Even though he was a cad, she helped him with his final illness because he couldn't afford the hospital. Mm. Um, do you know anything about her family just as a, a connection to the way that she uh, dealt with her partners? No, well, her family were Russian Jewish immigrants. Uh, she was uh, the second youngest of six children who survived. Um, the, they were all girls except the oldest. The eldest was uh, her brother Irving. But 
the family were uh, very working class. They, they ran a fish and vegetable store in Brooklyn and they had no, there was no artistic background at all. Gail Levin's biography of her, which I have here, this is it, uh, is excellent for the background on her family, her ethnic origins. Um, Gail went back to Schwal in, in uh, the Pale of Settlement and, and you know, traced the ancestry back. She also goes into Igor at some depth. And it's, um, it's a very interesting kind of departure. I mean, Lee was not tracked to do that. She was not tracked to be an artist. But Irving, the, the brother, encouraged her. The parents had no idea. But Irving was, was a bit of an intellectual, and he uh, helped her get interested in poetry and music. And he, so he was kind of a, a guiding force for her, although he himself was not an artist. Uh, I have a question from John Hans Hoffman said art expresses the artist and nothing else. Does this assume that the artist should seek self-understanding? Uh, I think it does in Hoffman's terms because where Hoffman is coming from was Munich and the school of Kandinsky where the spiritual in art was very important, the spiritual element in expressive art. Although Hoffman said that you should separate yourself from nature, that you should look at nature, according to Lee, his teaching was that you observed and then you brought that inside and then you uh, elaborated on that with your own um, uh, aesthetic spin on what you observed. Whereas Lee felt that Pollock was working from the opposite direction, from the inside out, and that was what she aspired to. So if you take that literally and you do really want to express yourself as an artist, you need to know yourself and what you're expressing so that other people can relate to it. But my sense from reading the book is that not many of these artists had a lot of self-understanding. Well, they may have had understanding of their motivations in terms of their artistic careers, but whether they understood themselves as human beings is, and what, they were, what effect they were having on others is definitely a question. And uh, you know, people like Pollock, they, they sought uh, psychological help. They went to psychiatrists and they went to uh, medical doctors to try and find out what was wrong with them. But in, in a sense, when they stepped into the studio, they went into another world. They went into their own world and expressed themselves as best they could. And for Pollock, of course, that was where he was functional. He wasn't functional in, in the real world, but in his, in his own art world, he was supremely functional. So maybe that was the best therapy. Oh, I do. John, I'm glad that you unmuted yourself. And, and I do... Uh, encourage everyone to do that too. And if you have a dog, just be on the alert, you know, but, uh, but by all means, follow up on these questions that you're asking. They're all, uh, they're all terrific. Well, uh, yeah, I see a question about Lee's relationship with Elaine de Kooning. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it was not, um, shall we, they were not sorority sisters. Let's put it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. They were fiercely loyal to their, their husbands, and clearly there was a rivalry between Jackson and Bill, so naturally the wives, you know, had to take sides. They, she was not, um, Lee was, I, I knew Lee slightly, I knew Elaine a lot better. Uh, Elaine was a remarkable woman who um, had also, like Lee, a sense of her own importance as an artist, her own gifts as an artist, her own vision as an artist, but who never ever would have put herself on a level with Bill, any more than Lee would have put herself on a level with Jackson. She always insisted that he was the genius. And she was a great artist, but she wasn't a genius like he was. And the same was with, with, uh, with Elaine and Bill. In fact, one of Elaine's most famous quotes when people would say, oh, it's so terrible, you're in Bill's shadow. And she would say, no, I'm in his light. So, and she, of course, did accept his name when they married. Her, real, her, last, her name was Freed. She was born Elaine Freed. Uh, Lee never changed her name. Oh, no, I tell a lie. She dropped one of the S's in her name. It was originally spelt Krasner with two S's, and she dropped one. 
and her birth name was Lena. So she, in her youth, she changed it to Lenore, a much more romantic Edgar Allan Poe kind of name. And then uh, she, her nickname was Lee, which is androgynous. And people often accused her of trying to pass herself off as a male artist, but that, that wasn't true. She was known as Lee from the time she was in high school. Uh, Helen, you had a uh, you had a connection to one of the other artists that's that are mentioned in um, in Ninth Street Women. Is that right? Well, I knew Helen Frankenthaler not well, but I did I did know her. Um, I did I met Grace Hardigan, I, but I never I never met or knew Joan Mitchell. So I did meet all four of the other five of, of the five. Wonderful. But I was quite friendly with Elaine. She and I, my connection to Lee actually came through a completely different uh, uh, avenue. I, for years, I was an art reviewer for the New York Times and covering Long Island. And periodically, I would contact her for a quote, or I would write about one of her shows, and she would write me a little note, things like that. So it was a more of a professional relationship rather than a, a personal friendship. Kathy, is it you who have asked this question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So you're asking about how Helen got started in her career. <laughs> yes. And I'm wondering also if you are an artist yourself, Helen. I did begin as an artist. I trained, I went to the Art Students League, like Bill, like Jackson and like Lee and so many others. And I was uh, training as a sculptor originally. I went to Adelphi University and that's where I got my undergraduate degree in art, studio art. Uh, then I went to the Brooklyn Museum Art School, just walking through the museum as an education, it's wonderful. And of course the school no longer exists, but the museum is still there. And then I went to art school in London, uh, Hornsey College of Art, which has also been absorbed into another, into the um, middle, Middlesex Polytechnic is now Middlesex University. And I practiced as an artist for a number of years, but then went back to graduate school in 1973 to get an art history degree. And then my museum career went on from there. Mm. I don't practice anymore. It's okay. I, I, <laughs> I wasn't a terribly, you know, I wasn't that ambitious. I mean, there are lots of artists who aren't that good, but are very ambitious. And so they get ahead. Mm -hmm. But I was pretty good, but I just wasn't that ambitious. Mm -hmm. And also, I'll tell you something. Art is very lonely. I mean, maybe not for somebody like Jeff Coons, you know, who has a giant workshop. But for most artists, they work alone. And as you may be able to tell, I'm kind of gregarious. <laughs> and I just drove myself crazy in the studio all by myself all day long. It was just, it, it was just making me nuts. Mm. And, and then you get so little recognition. You have to be dedicated in a way that someone like Lee was dedicated, where it doesn't matter what hardships you suffer. It doesn't matter what emotional problems you have. You just have to do the work. Right. And that just wasn't me. So do you prefer teaching to writing about art? I don't teach. Well, you don't uh, I, teach. I, I, no, I, I have taught and I do have an adjunct appointment at Stony Brook. You know, the Paula Krasner House belongs to Stony Brook University. And I have an adjunct uh, position in the art department, but I haven't taught in quite a few years. Uh, we give tours and, and that's enough teaching for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Uh, the way you describe artists in the studio is uh, so parallel to the pandemic and what I've been hearing from. Right. Uh, oh, the artists don't even notice it. They say, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Susan asks, can you speak about your connection to Lee Krasner while at the Parish Museum? Uh, it wasn't really through the parish. It was, it was through the times that I knew her in the 70s and, and early 80s. She died in 84. And the last time I saw her, when you, you saw that painting I showed uh, called Morning Glory, which was done in the summer of 82, that was done for a special exhibition at Guild Hall called Poets and Artists. And the artists were invited to collaborate with poets. That's why you see words in the picture. It's uh, from a quote from a poem by Howard Moss uh, called How Blue is Blue. And it's all about morning glories. So there was a kind of, um, uh, we did a video. I was hired by the museum to uh, help produce a video interviewing the artists and the poets. 
And we went to Lee's studio and we were supposed to interview her, but she wasn't having a good day. And so we, we never actually did. But that was the last time I saw her. Thank you. Gail has asked a question about uh, if you can share some information about Lee's early childhood and schooling. Well, she went to public school in Brooklyn, uh, PS 121, I think it was. And then she went to, she wanted to go to Washington Irving High School because it was the only school in New York City that offered art classes for girls. So she applied, but she didn't get in. And then she said, oh, the hell, well, because she wanted to be an artist from her childhood. So she said, the hell with it, I'm going to become a lawyer. So her family said, oh, that seems like a good idea. But she had to go to a local high school in Brooklyn, Girls High, and she hated it. So she reapplied to Washington Irving and she got in. So then she went there and very briefly went to the uh, Art Students League in 26, I think it was. Um, well, she, oh, no, she went to the Cooper Union first. She was in the girls' college at Cooper Union. Then, which was free in those days. And then she got into the league for just a month in the summer and then applied and got into the National Academy of Design. And that's where she got her major training. And that's where she met Igor. Thank you. Uh, let's see, a question about early collectors like Ben Heller, who was mentioned in the book. Uh, are there other early collectors that you can tell us about? Well, one I mentioned was B.H. Friedman, Bob Friedman, who collected Pollock's work and also like Krasner's because when, and, and both Ben Heller and Bob Friedman were a little bit later in the game. They came in the, in the mid fifties, like 54, 55, not right at the beginning because Peggy Guggenheim was not only his dealer, but she was also his patron and she collected his work. They had a contract where if she didn't sell enough work to make up the um, allowance that she was paying him, I think it was $2,400 a year. If she didn't sell $2,400 worth of work, she would take art in exchange. So she wound up with about 30 pictures, many of which she gave away, including the mural, which went to Iowa. But she peppered them around in different collections, which was so important in Europe and in America, because that got Pollock's name into the major collections. And of course she had, I think there are maybe about 10 left in her collection in Venice. But uh, she was really the one who started the commercial ball rolling. I mean, he'd never sold a thing before. And she made his first museum sale, which was the She-Wolf to the Museum of Modern Art for the munific munificent sum of $600. Down from 650, she had to get him a discount. But it was, you know, this was to have MoMA buy something out of his first solo show. This was huge. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to let him know, of course, were, negotiations went on for months. She wanted to let him and Lee know that this had gone through, but they didn't have a telephone. So she sent them a telegram, which we still have. Yeah, the reason I asked that question about Ben Heller, my dad worked for Ben Heller. Oh, really? Yeah, he ran, my dad managed a textile plant and the Heller company. Heller. Uh -huh. owned it. And he he was my he showed my dad a few of Jackson Pollock's works that he had purchased and asked him for his his interpretation. And my dad didn't know what to say, but I guess <laughs> Ben Heller became quite the expert later on on doing speaking engagements about. Oh, yeah. yeah, he gave a talk for us one time that was very, very, I mean, you know, he really was very knowledgeable and only just died. <laughs> was, he, was he any relationship to the Dr. Heller that helped Jackson Pollock with his no. alcoholism? No, that was Edwin Heller. He was a local man, mm -hmm. uh, went, went away to medical school and served in the army. And when, when he got discharged, he came back to practice in East Hampton. And very ironically, he was killed in an automobile accident in the spring of 1950, just before Jackson fell off the wagon. And one always has to speculate whether if Dr. Heller had still been alive, Jackson would have been able to turn to him and get himself back on track. But that wasn't obviously possible. Well, thank you. 
Uh, Helen, you're reminding me uh, when you talked about Jackson's accident to ask you to tell us a little about the three books. Uh, well, yeah, one of them is all about the accident. And that's this one, An Accidental Corpse. And it's my second mystery. I, the first one I wrote is about the surrealists and Jackson and Lee make cameo appearances, but they're not really uh, involved in the story. But after I did that one, you know, they say, write what you know. Well, I wasn't in East Hampton in 1956. I was only 12 years old and I was living in New York City. But I, I clearly, having worked at the Pollock House for decades, know the story behind the, the auto accident and have, you know, the autopsy report and everything. So I knew the, the bones of the story, but I thought I could give this a twist. <laughs> and the twist is that as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, there were three people in the car. Jackson was driving, his girlfriend, Ruth Kligman was there, and her friend, Edith Metzger, who was visiting for the weekend. Well, two of them died in the crash, but in my book, Metzger was already dead. So the question is, who killed her? <laughs> so now you've got to get the book. <laughs> 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 find out. <laughs> That's great. That great. What I've done in all three of them is to take real people and, at real times and places and put them in fictional situations mm -hmm. and bring in fictional characters like the detective who investigates the case to actually, you know, move the action along and, and make the story happen. But uh, the third one, it just came out this month, and that's called An Artful Corpse, and that is set at the Art Students League in 1967. Are any of them on, on audio, Helen? Yes. Uh, the first two are, I'm not sure about Artful. I haven't checked Amazon lately, but the first two are on audio and on Kindle. Great. Great. Well, I hope you will enjoy them. I know that uh, you already have one sale. Abby, who's on our call, bought one. Oh, of thank you, Abby. I went right out. I wanted to be the first. I'm so excited <laughs> to read. <laughs> I'm so excited to read it, Helen. Oh, cool. Well, the, yeah, the one about Pollock and Krasner, that one actually won an award. That, that won the Benjamin Franklin Gold Award for Mystery and Fiction. But uh, the first one, An Exquisite Corpse, that came out first, then uh, accidental, and now artful. And are they the same detective team throughout all three? Well, they they uh, no because they vary in time. The first one, the two de the the detectives who solved the second mystery, uh, only just meet. They meet on the case, and they're both uh, patrolmen or patrol people because one of them is female, obviously, uh, because in those days only men and women could get married. And these two fall in love and marry at the end of the book. And then they have a son and he is a part of the action in the second book. And then in the third book, he becomes the one who solves the mystery. Well, we know what we'll be reading again. Yep. <laughs> hey, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Pollock Krasner house right now in 2021, uh, as far as it being open and what activities, uh, are going on, if, if any of our attendees could get there, what would they see? Well, you could get there virtually uh, because at this time of year, we're, we're normally closed and we, we open, we're seasonal, we open in May, uh, but we've been doing Zoom tours and they've been very popular. We've had people from all over the world, which is one of the great things about Zoom. I know everyone's very tired of looking at rectangles, but it actually makes it so much more accessible and we will be reopening on May 1st with an exhibition of paintings by Mary Abbott, who is one of the female artists in the Abstract Expressionist group. Um, she was a um, close friend, although according to her, not a lover of Bill de Kooning. And her, her abstractions are quite beautiful. If any of you saw the Denver show that the Denver Museum did three years ago of the women of abstract expressionism, she was in that. And so we're having a group of her, she died last year, no, in 2019, she was 98. And she will be our first show. And then our second show opening at the end of July will be Picasso in Pollock. 
So we're having, we're going to show how Picasso's work influenced Pollock's development. Well, we're open from May to October. And if you go online on our website, you can book a, we're doing all of our tours by appointment uh, or by reservation. Uh, you can book also a virtual reality tour, which you have to be there to do it because you have to wear a headset. Although it is being uh, marketed as an app, and it will be available soon for people who have the technology. But you put the headset on and you literally feel like you're in the studio as it was when Pollock was painting there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we don't have, something you will not see when you come to the museum, is paintings by Pollock or Krasner because we did not inherit their art. We inherited the property and all of the contents that were in the buildings when, they, when we died but we did not get the work because that went to establish a foundation, the Pollock Krasner Foundation that gives grants to artists. So that's a completely separate organization, although they have been very generous to us. But um, what we interpret is their lives. But of course, people want to relate the art to where it was made. So with virtual reality, what you can do is make an immersive experience in which people feel themselves to be in that environment. So you put the thing on and bingo, you're in Pollock's studio in 1950 and one of his paintings comes back and sh show right where he was painting it. And he talks about it. We have his voice. So we have him talk about it. And then the scene shifts to the studio in the 1960s when Lee was using it. And then she talks about it. And you know, you saw that photograph of her standing on a ladder in front of one of her big paintings. Well, she decided she didn't like to work on a ladder. She wanted the work to be directly in relation to her physical space, her physical being. And uh, it's interesting to hear her say that. And then you see her at work on one of her paintings. So this takes about 10 minutes and it follows the guided tour. So people who want to book that you book it as a package. You can only do that after you've taken the guided tour, but you don't have to do it. And then after the guided tour, people can hang around and look at, but we, we have to limit admissions because of COVID. So we only have six on a tour, which is great for the six people on the tour. I mean, they get personal attention and it's good for us too, because there's less wear and tear on the property. It's a very small site. When you go on the website, you can see pictures of it, and it is it is quite intimate. It sounds wonderful. Um, at the MFA in Boston, they have an exhibition of American women artists in the American wing, and I think all five of the women in the book are their paintings are featured in that exhibition. Is that on? How long is that on for? Do you know, John? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to double check the website, but. Oh, well, I'll, I'll do that myself. Yeah. And of course, some of these works are on, like the Whitney often has the uh, seasons up, you know, many of them being part of the permanent collection, they'll have them pretty much on view a lot of the time. So you can always be pretty sure to see one when you go in, but they're constantly changing their installation so that they can rotate the permanent collection. So you never know for sure what's going to be there. You know, people will come on the tour and they'll say, oh, can I see the She-Wolf? You just told me that Peggy Guggenheim sold it for $600. Gee, I really want to see that painting. And I say, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if mama's got it up right now. So it's always a little bit hit or miss. There's no monographic museum devoted to either of them. Helen, I have a very particular question and uh, that involves the piece entitled White Squares, 1948, beautiful uh -huh. work. How was that framed if it was framed at all? Is that the one I showed? It is the one you showed. Oh, and, um, and I noticed that, you know, he. Pollock didn't frame. Let me just find it here. Um, Beautiful piece and very different. White squares, where are we? Here it is. Oh no, it doesn't show the frame. No. Um, many of the frames are very simple. The ones that they framed themselves, they tended to frame in like wood strips. Mm -hmm. 
we borrowed one of the little image paintings from Philadelphia. When we, we did in 2008, we did a, a centennial show for Krasner was the 100th anniversary of her birth. And we borrowed a beautiful, we borrowed quite a few actually. We, we focused on the little image paintings because those were the first series, that was the first series she did when she moved to East Hampton. And so we had, oh, I think 11 of them. And this beautiful one from, from Philadelphia Museum has the original wood frame and it's just it's cut out strips of, of plywood. You know, you know, half inch square, just somebody ripped it with a saw and made four pieces and put them on the picture, but they kept them because mm -hmm. they were original. Mm -hmm. So anything that hasn't been reframed is in a pretty simple frame. I don't know, that, that picture I showed belongs to the Whitney. So maybe on their website, it might show it in its framed state. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I'm actually going to New York fairly soon. So when I saw that it was at the Whitney, I think I, I'm going to track it down. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if they have it up, but there again, you know, they don't have everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'll still be a good trip anyway, though. <laughs> so, um, but that's interesting. I, you know, it's always the framing decisions that artists make are, are always so interesting to me. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with whatever material might just be around. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Well, we have a little painting in the collection. We have one Pollock painting. And I don't know if you have a minute, <laughs> well, you do, I guess, have a minute. I'll describe how we got it. Um, we didn't, as I mentioned, we didn't inherit any of the art, but the, someone who lived across the street contacted me and said, I have this little painting by Pollock and I'd like advice about having it repaired. It's, it's got a couple of flakes. So she brought it in and it's from around 1938. It's a kind of um, Native American influence, Orozco influence, Picasso influence. It actually inspired the Picasso and Pollock show, but it, um, was done on a piece of, of um, like formica, shiny material. Yeah. So I gave her the name of a conservator and, and I said, you know, take it to him. And she said, well, you know, maybe I'd like to leave it to you in my will. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. You know, we'd be happy to have it. And a couple of years later, she got back to me and she said, you know, I want to give it to you now because I think I'd like to know that people are enjoying it while I'm alive. Well, that was 20 years ago and she only just died last year. So we didn't have to wait for it. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> I'm not happy that she died. She was a lovely person, but she was very, very old too. Anyway, we got the picture and uh, when she gave it to us, she wrote us a little note about it. And she said, Pollock framed it himself. So if you come to visit, or if you go on our website and look at it, you will see a simple frame. It's got a little bit of a mat and a rabbit, and then it's got a kind of a 50s looking wood frame. And it was the payment to her husband for writing Jackson's will. It was a trade. So uh, Jerry Weinstock wrote the will, Jackson gave them the painting as payment. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, that's the one and only Pollock that we have. Oh, great story. Mm. Uh, oh, thank you for Women Take the Floor at the MFA Boston. Uh, if we are in Boston, we can see it through November 28th. Wow, good, good, thank you. Good group. Janet, you have another point here, huh? Let's see. <coughs> oh, the video of Jackson uh, working on glass panel is on YouTube. Yeah, I've seen that one too. That's, that's fabulous. Yeah, it's not only glass. He also works on a, a canvas that's spread out on the concrete pad behind the house, which is the original floor of the barn. The barn was located directly behind the house when they bought it and they had it moved to the side of the property so that it wouldn't block the view. We look right out across a salt marsh to a little river called Akabonic Creek. And so it's a lovely vista and they wanted to take advantage of that. Excellent. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments? Well, I have a comment because I would like to recommend a book about Lee. It's called Lee and Me. This is a memoir of a, a summer spent with Lee at the Pollock Krasner House in 1974, written by Ruth Applehoff, who became the director of Guild Hall. And she had gone to stay with Lee because she was writing her master's thesis on Lee. And Lee invited her to come out and live with her in the summer. And I think she really wanted a driver. 
because poor Ruth wound up being her, what the English would call a dog's body. And she did a lot of taped interviews with her, but she never published them. She did her, her master's thesis, but then she never took it anywhere. And when she retired from Guildhall, she said she wanted to work up, you know, more of a, not just a, an oral history, but follow some of the topics that she hadn't explored when she had the chance to, to talk to Lee in person. And she's done a wonderful job of really delving into certain aspects of Lee's character and Lee's background that other authors haven't really, not that they haven't touched on it, because Gail's book is, is extremely uh, um, comprehensive, but they, they hadn't really developed them. And I, I highly recommend it. She did a lot of her research at the Pollock House using two grants from the Pollock Krasner Foundation. So that's a very good one. And um, also, I, you had asked me, Mim, about if people are interested in learning more about the artists who lived and worked in the Hamptons. Yes. And that would be this one, Hamptons Bohemia. It's out of print. You'd have to get it on... Um, a books or book finder, but and I, sometimes they have used copies on Amazon, but it's, I was, I co-authored it with Constance Denny, who is the literary person. I did the art. She did the writers. So it's the subtitle is two centuries of artists and writers on the beach. And it talks about the development and evolution of the art colony. That's right. Cause I was mentioning that we had an art colony meeting. Oh, so this would be a nice one to, to look into. Thank you. Two centuries of artists and writers on the beach. Hamptons, Bohemia. Okay. In the chat. Very good. All right, I'm going to make just a couple of announcements allowing everyone to think of any final questions before we break. Uh, I did want to, for those who were in our meeting last time, to uh, mention that I spoke with Valerie Ballant, our speaker on uh, historic artist homes and studios. She's fine tuning her list of recommended books and is going to get that to me uh, in the next couple of weeks. And I will post that on the museum's website. So well, one of them you've got to have is, of course, the book that she wrote, which I guess was your inspiration, the wonderful guidebook to our 44 sites. And we actually have four more now. We have 48 sites altogether. And talk about a great armchair tour. So it really makes you eager to get back on the road and see these places in person. That's right. She, that's the book that we talked about last time in uh, January, and we loved it. She was oh, a wonderful yes. speaker. She did a fantastic job. She's digging deep. And she mentioned, it was confidential, but just between this group, that um, new properties were being added. So yeah. those new ones are, have been added. And, and yeah. that, it was just announced in February. That's right. That's right. So that was a, a great one. We'll be posting our next book for our meeting and the meeting date on our website within um, the next couple of days. So it, it, we're looking at a Saturday in May. We tend to skip a couple of months between, so we have some reading time, but that will be on our, on the museum's website, attleboroartsmuseum.org. And then I wanted to point out to everybody that we are open to masked visitors. So right now we have our Back to Nature show and that's up through March 19th. And uh, at this point we would actually be welcoming about a thousand people or more to the gallery today um, if we were having our flower show. But the flower show, because we would be welcoming about a thousand mm. people, uh, has been canceled this year. However, uh, we are fortunate to have some of the greatest hits of the, of the flower show. We have our Back to Nature, nature-themed art exhibition that is up. And I face a window that looks into the gallery. And since this meeting has started, I have seen tons of people walk through, which has been great. There, um, that flower show is a fundraising event and, uh, and a derivative uh, of that would be our raffles. We have incredible irresistible raffles. We have sponsorship opportunities for individuals and businesses. The gift shop has expanded. So all of that is going on in tandem, uh, parallel to Back to Nature. So again, until the 19th, the raffles stay up a little bit longer online. Um, and I did want to 
let you know that if you're in downtown Attleboro 24 seven, you can take a tour of some of our permanent collection holdings there uh, pictured on banners that are attached to light poles. And there's a tour online uh, that will take you through all 22 images right now. It's COVID friendly. Um, and there's again, no, no admission. Well, we don't have admission, but no admission outside. You can do it whenever you like. Um, and you, um, you can learn all about this work uh, by visiting our website. So take that self-guided tour. And um, the final thing I wanted to say is, Helen, thank you so very much. You have been a wonderful presenter and uh, an incredible source of information and inspiration for several books that I know we're all going to open up and read.